Good, mo Good morning, everybody. This is Anne-Marie Serrano. I'm the Regional Emergency GBV Advisor. And thank you to all of you for coming to this presentation. So we're going to have uh, Dr. Nora Svaras. Uh, sorry for the, the pronunciation. <laughs> it's, fi it's fine. Thank you very much. And Elizabeth Lagma. And they're going to, to facilitate this webinar. Please, uh, give, I give the floor to both of you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Fine. Fine. Thank you very much. And first of all, I want, uh, on behalf of uh, Elizabeth and myself, to, to welcome you all to this webinar. We are very, very enthusiastic about uh, the possibility to talk to you, discuss with you towards the end of the session, but also to be to be able to present some of our experiences and some of the work that we have been uh, looking into for some time. Um, so we are going to spend these for these next 45 minutes trying to present a manual on mental health and gender-based violence, where we have the focus on helping survivors of sexual uh, violence in conflict, a training manual. Next. So the next slide, please. So we, um, we will say a little bit more about ourselves, but I want just to make this very brief introduction as to why this manual. And we are very aware that all of you are very actively engaged with this problem in a manner which we can hardly even imagine because of the, the seriousness and the violence that you are confronted with every single day. And we hope that this work of ours may be a little aid and a little inspiration to you in your daily work because we know that you have uh, such enormous challenges that you're dealing with on a daily basis. So we want just to say why this manual? We see the work as a part of the international effort to combat gender-based violence in conflict and war. We are aware of the high number of violence against women in particular that takes place in conflict and war and we want to see our manual as a part of the international effort to combat this. We are also in the work building on existing guidelines with a clear focus on mental health and support to victims. Often guidelines focus on extremely important things, but we feel that the mental health of the survivor as well as the helper need to be focused more clearly. And also, we try to give input and inspiration to caregivers. Next, please. So these are the two that you will be talking to today. I am Nora Sveos. I'm a clinical psychologist working in Norway. I'm working with refugees and have been working clinically with torture refugees, torture victims for the last 30, 40 years. And I've also been a member of the UN Committee Against Torture, and I'm now presently a member of the UN Subcommittee for the Prevention of Torture. And Elizabeth? Hello, my name is Elizabeth Langdahl, and I'm the Executive Director of Health and Human Rights Info. I have a master's degree in human geography, and I've been working with the Health and Human Rights Info for the last seven years, and on this topic as for such a... Uh, for the same amount of time. Thank you, next. So what characterizes this manual that we will present to you? And towards the end of our presentation, we will inform you more about how to open the web page and how to look into it for those of you who have not had the chance to do it yet. And we also will uh, suggest a further continuation in the contact regarding this manual. So, but what characterizes it? First of all, we call it a low intensity training because it's not it's not a specialist work. It's it's meant for people who are working in the fields very directly with with survivors of gender-based violence and conflict. We have a strong focus on mental health and the psychological reactions to traumatic events. We do hope that through the manual, we create a better understanding of what are the consequences in the lives of the survivors 
after having been exposed to such a severe trauma, and that this understanding may be a valuable tool also for the helper. We see our manual as something that provides practical interventions, and it opens for exercises and skills training. I will come back to all of this. We are also very interested in being resource oriented because even in the light of tragedy that we're talking about, we must take as a starting point the survival, survival energy and the resources in the persons affected. We do not want to think pathology and diagnosis from the very beginning. On the contrary, we want to collaborate with the resources and the strength of the survivor. And finally, it builds on experience and local knowledge. Thank you. Next. We see this as a tool for training. It can be used in training with others as a part of supervision, but also group work and self-study. And we have had examples where people are doing this as a self-study and as part of a group discussion. We also are very conscious of the fact that the world is, has different norms and different standards in many different places, and we always have to adjust uh, a training program to, to what is possible and also what is valid in the context that this is being done. Of course, we feel that the human rights basis that all of this has is, is the same all over the world, but nevertheless, there may be room for adaptations. And furthermore, it's important to know that this work has been developed by clinicians, but can be worked with by people without any formal training, that is not necessarily psychologists or psychiatrists, but people who have the expert from working on the ground uh, in the practical work with the survivors. We hope that the, the manual is self-explanatory in a way that it can be used and, and finally, it builds upon clinically informed and human rights based approach. So we, we hope that the added value of this is that we provide learning new skills for helping survivors. We try to empower the survivors by, by knowing and understanding and finding ways to deal with traumatic memories that is being very concrete. And finally, we hope also that we have a community perspective, namely engaging the community in this work. Next, please. As you see, this is just to present our, our web page, which is what we are working from, and Elizabeth will explain more towards the end. Next. The manual that we will be talking about is, is developed by a group of dedicated and experienced professionals. And all of these, as you see, women, mostly psychologists and psychiatrists, have all been engaged in 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 context with war and violence both in uh, in iraq in in palestine in bosnia and other places in the world engaged in this work thank you next and the funding for this work was made possible by the norwegian ministry of foreign affairs and mental health project norway thank you we now we have done, we can take the next slide. Now that we have made some very few words of introduction to the background of the manual, I want to invite Elizabeth to present some words about how the manual is constructed. So Elizabeth, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, the manual is quite extensive and it's divided into three parts. Uh, the first part uh, is the introduction, and it's divided into 15 teams or boxes. And these boxes have basic information and ideas that uh, you need to know uh, before you start the actual training part. 
the actual training part um, is laid out as a um, manuscript. So it gives instructions to the trainer and, uh, and also tells the trainer exactly what to say. I'll show you that later. But it also consists of um, group exercises, grounding techniques, role plays and discussion, and introducing and the butterfly woman metaphor. And the last part is uh, a theory part with further resources, reading and uh, presentations of theory. Next, please. So as I said, the, the, the actual training part is uh, divided into two pages. But we have um, icons that will make it easier for you to, to see where we have exercises, role play exercises, key points, grounding exercises, and uh, discussions. And we also have the whole story, the metaphor of the butterfly woman. And you will see in the manual that is um, very obvious where the, where the story starts. Next, please. So as I told you, the, the ma uh, training part is laid out as a manuscript. There is a left side and a right side. And the, the manual, this part of the manual, it has to be read to two paged. So that the, these two pages has to be seen side by side. So on the left side, it's everything that the trainer needs to know. So this should be read uh, in advance. Of course, and on the right side, it's what is to be said loud to the audience. So if you think of this as a manuscript, this is how it's laid out. Thank you. Next, please. And of course, even even if this sounds like something that is very strict and um, and. Uh, uh, almost coercive. It's not. It's not like that. It's meant. It's meant as an inspiration and as an idea for the work that you are doing in the field, or that we are doing when we are dealing with these issues. So it's something that we hope can be discussed also among yourselves, as how can this feed into what you're doing already. So when we when we talk about making the manual useful, we speak about implementing in a way that works in your everyday experience and context, including your cultural context and time frame. And there may be parts that you want to use more directly than others. So again, this is very much open for your, your, uh, your analysis and your experience. So the next one, and I will go more into the some of the themes in the manual itself. To start out, we, and I think I want to give a very short story here because the colleagues that have been working with this, they started working in the Congo, the DRC Congo. They have been there for three or four times working with the women who are supporting the rape victims in Congo. So much of this work has been developed in a collaboration between the helpers in Congo and us as Norwegian psychologists and psychiatrists. And then we have uh, collaborated with colleagues all over the world to try to develop some good ideas, metaphors, and ways of presenting this material. But one of the basic ideas of our work is to focus on the good helper because and we usually we use a lot of drawings and group activities all through the training and one of the first points that we deal with is what is the good helper in the context in which the person is working we know that the good helper is the main person in the collaboration here. And we are very interested in encouraging people to think very clearly for themselves also. What is it we do that may help? What is it that we do that can, that can have a good um, 
that can be a good experience for the survivor. So one of the first actions that we do in the training is to discuss and have drawings about what is a good helper. And for instance, here a group has drawn pictures of a good helper. She needs big ears to listen. She needs good feet to stand on. She needs a bladder so she, so she doesn't have to go out and, and pee so often. I mean, these are very concrete examples of what is a good good helper. And on the next slide, you see one drawing that was made in one of the sessions that we did uh, in a country using <laughs> Arabic language. So here you may recognize and read better than we can do. What are some of the characteristics of the good helper? But the idea of us of focusing on the good helper is to to strengthen the the um, the awareness of what are the tools that the good helper may have in his or her bag, so to speak, when she or he meets with people who have been strongly exposed to trauma. The next, please. We speak about tools in work with survivors. And some of these tools are, of course, very basic. And all of you are using and are perfectly aware of these. But especially in periods of crisis and heavy burden, it's important to, to strengthen the awareness of what is actually the good tools that we can use. And here we list up things like listening, especially respecting and acknowledging painful reactions. Very focus on communicating that you see the person, that the person feels seen and understood. And we put a lot of emphasis on creating a safe place. Although this may be extremely difficult in situations that are not safe. But the safety that you may create may be for some minutes or half an hour at the time in the relationship with the person. But it's about being creating something that the person can experience as somewhat safe. An important part of the work with trauma victims will also always be stabilizing a person by being here and now oriented. As we have all experienced from our work with trauma victims, people are very much in the past, they are afraid, they are not here and now oriented uh, after having been exposed. So one of the ways of stabilizing the person is to help her to become here and now oriented. For this, we can use grounding exercises and the manual is actually full of concrete exercises and examples of stabilizing approaches that you can use in the work. We also include relaxation and energizing exercises. And even if it may be a bit paradoxical to try to do relaxation in situations which may be ongoing and stressful, it's nevertheless important as a part of stabilization of persons who have been seriously exposed. And finally, psychosocial, psychoeducational approaches we find very important because we know that it's important for a person to understand him or herself the reactions that they may have. So the next, please. We also want to focus one part, which we have discussed a bit also with Anna Maria as a very important part of, of the work, namely to focus uh, on yourself as a helper. It's very stressful to be in the situation as a helper, constantly meeting persons with dramatic and very tragic experiences. And we know that helpers themselves can become vicariously traumatized, or as we call it, secondarily traumatized, and even suffer from compassion fatigue. 
we hope that most of the agencies that you are working with are very aware of these problems and enable also and give some space for care also for the helpers. But in this care, we would suggest using some of the same stabilizing and grounding approaches because we have experience that these also may be helpful in the work, not only with survivors, but also with helpers. And none of us are heroes and not affected by by what or heroes in the sense that we're not affected. We are heroes in the ways that we can recognize our own needs and reactions and understand what triggers them and what may change them. And here also we hope that some of the input from the manual may be of use for you. So the next slide. I'm aware that this become this is a very brief presentation and a very super, super very superficial one of course but we do hope that this may trigger some some of your curiosity to, to look into it and hopefully it can at least inspire some of your work which is so important on the daily basis one of the aspects of the manual is to get closer on to what does trauma mean from a psychological point of view? And I think that we know from, from the work that and from our contact with colleagues all over the world that people react in some way quite similarly to severe trauma. And one of the definitions or one of the ways of understanding a traumatic event is one that has the capacity to, call, to cause mental and physical trauma. And faced by such an event, the immediate response of the person or the body and the mind is to struggle for survival. And this is expressed by our tendency to fight if we are in danger or to flee if we are in danger even to freeze, that is to feel absolutely stiff, and many of us have probably experienced freezing as well, or submission, that is, we give up in a way, we just play dead, which may be a survival strategy as well. Some of these basic reactions are similar to what we also can see in non-humans, so we have something similar also here. The next, please. Just to repeat something which you all are perfectly aware of, but I think we need sometimes to, it's good to, to, to um, look, at, look into this very often because this is what we see in people who we meet, namely that they have met situations which have been overwhelming, inescapable and very frightening. And often trauma is defined as situations which, which, which go beyond the, the, the coping mechanisms of the person. It is a situation where the person may feel loss of control and it's beyond what we are prepared to deal with. Of course, being attacked and being exposed to humiliation, to rape, to other forms of violence goes way beyond what people are normally prepared to deal with. Also, it threatens life and integrity, and most people would struggle with serious reactions such as intrusive memories, re-experiences, flashbacks, and sleeping problems. And I think in particular, the sleeping problems are something which we see very often, and people have nightmares, re-experiences, which also takes away the energy that they need to be able to, to move on in their lives. Therefore, we think that some of the grounding exercises, the stabilization exercises may be good as part of this. Next, please. One of the serious challenges that people are exposed with are the triggers and the trauma reminders. Because there's so many situations in the lives of persons that remind them 
of what they have experienced. So what happens? People may often not want to leave the house or leave the bed or leave wherever they are because every situation in the normal life brings back the memory of the painful event. And we can call these triggers and trauma reminders. And we have probably all met again and again people who suffer from serious flashbacks. The trauma me memory comes back and gives them a feeling that they may be back in the very serious, painful, frightening situation. Again, this is why we try to introduce grounding, stabilizing, here and now exercises in order to bring people back to here and now, not to the painful past. Next, thank you. In order to understand trauma, what it means in the life of the survivor, trauma reactions and dealing with these, we use a metaphor all through the, the manual. And you may find this perhaps a bit peculiar, but we have discussed and find that it may be a good picture to use because it's a metaphor, it's a story, it's not a real lady, so to speak, but she has a lot of the qualities that usually people have. And using the metaphor is also a way to explain the course of the trauma, how it happens, how it is in the aftermath, how it can be dealt with by the helpers, etc. So we use the metaphor butterfly woman to, to explain to the helpers uh, and give them a picture of how this is and how it can be met. Next, please. So here you have one, and we use, as I said, a lot of drawings and the groups that are in the training sit together and they draw and they develop some ideas. But this is a good, this is the butterfly woman before the bad things happen. As you see, she has good memories of the past. She has had some safe places to rest. She has plans for the future. She has care for her children. She has all the good things that we characterize as strength and resources in life. Next, please. Then the worst has happened. She has been exposed to a severe trauma. In the manual, it's explained as a, a violation or as a rape by soldiers when she was out to, to get some water or wash clothes. Um, she feels that her life has practically ended. The worst has happened and all what was good and right in life is gone. And as you see, this is an illustration of what happens in many of the people we are working with, a feeling that everything that was good and nice and trustful and safe was gone, immediately gone, never to come back. And in addition, a number of women suffer from feelings of guilt, feelings of having been responsible for what happened, and some may even be ostracized from their own community because of what has happened. And in, again, here we find it so important to underline the, the human rights perspective, because what she has been exposed to is an extreme and a very ugly form of human rights violation. And psychologically, this is often what happens to her. So the next, please. We, we carry the story about the butterfly woman in the way that it also describes meeting the helper because the butterfly woman meets the helper and we describe what the helper can do and what meeting a helper, what it means in terms of being understood and respected, listened to, but not encouraged to say more than what she wants to say. There has been a number of different thinking about this, and we know that some people encourage people to talk about what has happened 
despite that they're not prepared to do that themselves. We think that respecting the borders and the limits and the choices of the person it's, uh, herself is extremely important. So never to force her to talk about something that feels extremely humiliating and terrible before she is prepared to do it herself. On the other hand, what is very important seems to try to, try to make an alliance by being present, communicating that you respect, that communicating that you understand what has happened, and providing some feeling to the other that she is not alone. Thank you. Thank you. By going through the butterfly story, so uh, to speak. From a, a ecological sport for TVB survivors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's thing for the breakfast. <laughs> yeah. For the breakfast. But it's very interesting Hello? Yeah, I think yeah, I think <laughs> I think we have um some some uh interfer or s probably please, some microphones. Can you all turn off your micro please until we get to the questions and answers? Thank you. We yes you can we go ahead, please. We look very much forward to have some, some comments and questions, but we will, I will just briefly bring you through some of these points. Again, coming back to stabilization, through the explanation of what the helper does to the butterfly woman, we are able to provide information about approaches that helps to handle trauma-related reactions. That is stabilizing, stabilizing ways to, to talk and to deal with these. And here we explain some grounding experiences as stabilizing methods for handling strong emotions of fear or flashbacks when a memory takes over and is experiences as it happens here and now. We, we can all experience when we sit in front of a person who is so overwhelmed by what she or he has experienced that you feel that they are practically not touching the ground. They have, they are so, so much in the past, there's so much in the fear and in their strong reactions that what we should do as the first approach is try to get them back to here and now, reorienting them to the present, saying that you are sitting with me now, I am Nora or I am Elizabeth, I am sitting here with you, Right now, nobody is disturbing us. We can speak. You can feel the chair under your, under your body, and you can feel your feet on the ground, and you can feel how you are in contact with the ground. All these very simple techniques and strategies may calm some of the triggers. And in the manual, you will find a number of examples of how these calming or stabilizing or grounding exercises can be used. In the manual, we, we encourage people to do the training about this in the groups in order for when they speak to survivors in the real life, they can use some of these strategies to calm and to bring people to the here and now. And often we have to practice ourselves to be able to be, to be as here and now ourselves, because we also get triggered, of course, by, by what has happened to people. You will find examples of, for instance, encouraging the survivor to look around in the room to see to see what they see in order to bring them here and now. We sometimes suggest that people have a little stone in their hand to press to remind them that they are here and now. So these are, again, ways of calming some of the triggers and teaching the survivor ways of reacting, not to be overwhelmed by triggers. So you can see that all these things that we have mentioned now are ways of assisting a person in an early stage. It's not specialized therapy in any way. It's ways of communicating respect, 
initial help and assistance and also assisting her in understanding that these these violations are human rights violations that she is an innocent person that things has been done to her that are crimes in addition to the calming grounding exercises and this is not something that is done with for once and for all it's something we have to do often again and again so the the but so the manual is full of examples of how this can be done and practical exercises in order to obtain tools in the work so to move to the next because as we said, this is just a little taste of what is in, we can have the reporting. Still, the reporting. Go back once, please. Yeah, thank you. Many times we will want people to report the events that, has, that have taken place. But we, I think we must be very careful. As a human rights activist, of course, I'm all for as much reporting as possible. But as a psychologist, I'm also very aware of the problems entailed in reporting. In many places, she may be more exposed after having reported than than when if she does not report. So this is this is always a balance. And I think we as helpers must be very close to her will about reporting. And if she decides to report, we should be in we should be in close collaboration and also assist her in that reporting in the sense that we support the person emotionally. We have tried to describe this process in some detail in the um, in our manual and we hope that this also may be of use for you because i know that this is the discussion that you are having on a regular basis thank you next so we have have discussed the butterfly woman and how she has been going through the different stages of re-experiences of fear of being helped, being assistant, assisted, being of course in doubt as to whether she can return to her family. All these things have been explained through the butterfly woman. And in the training and in work, it can always be an, a good thing to find a good way to end the story. Because the story may also in the direct work with women that be a sort of a a hope or a, a story of hope or a story of possibilities so if we can find a way that she solves or she moves ahead in her life this can be a good story to discuss with the survivors to give them some hope uh, and to move on in their lives despite the severe trauma so we encourage always people to develop good stories as seem fit in their own context thank you thank you so when we had discussed and worked on this manual we of course wanted to ask some questions for instance could this be used across borders is it as self-explanatory as we had hoped, etc.? So these are some questions that we raised, and we did try it out in the Middle East. We've been to Turkey, to Colombia, to Asia, Norway, of course, and other places. And, and we see that some of the exercises, some of the ways that things are explained seem to be very clearly usable across borders but this is of course up to you to decide how this can be implemented in your context uh, if you see the pra are the practical tools good enough can they be further developed in your context and we do hope that they can uh, do the training because this is a three-day training does it give a sense of mastery to the participants because the participants are the ones who are doing the work on the ground does the human rights perspective come across can it improve what we do in practice will it strengthen support to victims and i would say can it also strengthen the support to helpers thank you thank you next so these were some of the discussions that we had 
So what we're doing now is to try to disseminate this work as much as possible. And a web page that Elizabeth will talk about now has been developed to guide further use. We will include a question and, sec and answer section in this page. So this is something that we hope to be able to follow up also with you in the time to come. Thank you. Bonjour. The next, please. So, Elizabeth, can you please explain? Uh, we will do this very briefly now. Explain the the manual web page and a further contact, and then we would look very much forward to to question answers and and replies. But now, Elizabeth, I want to invite you to to con to say something about the follow up. Yes, we have uh, made a manual web page. So it will be easy for you to uh, get direct information. For example, we have uh, uh, outlined uh, how the pilots were done and what feedback we got from the different pilots. That will tell you a little bit more about uh, the discussions we had during the, the making of this manual. And we also have um, a, a page where you can download the manual in different versions, not different versions, but you have like an online uh, version and you have a PDF version. Um, we also have uh, a question and answer page that we continuously update. And we have a news uh, page where we tell you about the latest um, trainings that we are conducting. Uh, what we are trying to do now is to make um, a part where we introduce how to do your own training. How, what is the most appropriate setting? How many people should you invite? Um, when are you supposed to take the breaks and all these practical issues around doing the training? This is. Uh, our, this is a page that is uh, continuously worked on, and if you have uh, more questions and issues, I'd be more than happy to to answer those. Uh, on, and the mail or m our contact uh, information will be on this page as well. Thank you. So the next. So we we think that the best the best way of using the manual is also to to have the discussions uh, in in groups of helpers who are in the field working with survivors to to explore what are the good experiences of working with survivors what are the lessons learned from their own work and how can the additional value of this manual be a tool in their practical work. We would like these questions just to be raised, discuss situ and if there were some time after the session today, it would be good that you that are sitting in the teams uh, could discuss this among yourself. What are the situations that are most difficult to work with in, in your work with survivors? And what are the topics that could be particularly useful in your work with survivors? because we are keenly aware that you are working, all of you, under very severe stress and with people with very serious um, serious experiences. And I, can, I want to share also our admiration to your work and our very strong sense of solidarity in, in your work from, from us as professionals here in Norway. So I think with these words, we would like to end our formal presentation and would very much want to engage uh, the minutes that you have available for questions and, and thinking out loud. So if that can be of any use, we would very much want to, to be part of that. Thank you very much.